Hey everyone, I'm Richard and today we're going to answer one very simple question. Can the Core i5 2500K still hack it in a modern gaming PC? Now this is the classic i5. Released in 2011, it's virtually unheard of for any PC component to have a five-year lifespan. But here we are in 2016 and legions of gamers are still standing by the legendary Sandy Bridge processor. But the evidence suggests that the chip may not be quite as all-powerful these days as many may like to think. We ran this video a while back comparing a stock i5 2500K to a modern Skylake i3. Both were running an overclocked GTX 970 with a 60 FPS frame rate limit and the results they were quite sobering. In titles like Assassin's Creed Unity, Far Cry 4 and The Witcher 3, the dual core i3 actually had the better of the older i5 quad. But looking at those results, we were convinced that the 2500K had much more to offer. Now overclocking is an obvious route forward, but we have noted that faster RAM can provide just as much of a boost. So we actually ran four sets of benchmarks, the i5 at stock and with a 4.6 gigahertz overclock. And we ran that test with 1600 megahertz RAM and 2133 megahertz RAM. And the latter is the fastest that you can run on the Sandy Bridge platform. To put CPU and memory performance to the forefront, we used Titan X at 1080p resolution. The idea here is to remove the GPU as a bottleneck, as much as we could. Now, the results are quite fascinating. In our Skylake benches, Battlefield 4 is mostly GPU bound, but not here. Just adding faster memory increases performance by 10%, overclocking by 18%. Both in concert produce a 24% boost to performance. Ubisoft's Far Cry 4 thrives with threads, clock speed, and memory bandwidth. So we get a 16% boost to performance just by moving from 1600 MHz to 2133 MHz RAM. Overclocking on its own adds 27%. Both together, that's a whopping 50% of extra performance. Next up, The Witcher 3. In this CPU-heavy stress test, in Novigrad City, once again we see a huge improvement to performance just with faster memory, 15% to our average frame rate. Overclocking gives us 20% of additional performance and put those together and we hit 42% in total. So the point is that in extending the life of your system there are actually two potential overclocking vectors, CPU clock speed and memory bandwidth. We've observed that different games tend to favour one or the other, while many benefit from both. Crisis 3 here, that is an excellent example of how we only get very small gains in moving to faster RAM. Boosts here are only in the region of 2 to 3%. Put simply, if you already own a 2500K and you've already overclocked it as far as you can take it, I reckon there's a good chance that you're still running with 1333 or 1600 MHz RAM. You might not even have XMP memory overclocking enabled in the BIOS, even if you do have faster sticks, meaning that they're running very, very slowly. All of which is fascinating, of course, but let's say that you've overclocked your 2500K to the limits and you are indeed running correctly configured DDR3. How does this maxed out configuration compare to the latest Skylake processors? What is the modern equivalent? Well, hold on to your hats here. By my reckoning, a 4.6 GHz 2500K is equivalent to today's i5-6500 paired with 2666 MHz DDR4. It's an interesting comparison, and actually the stock Skylake can run faster, born out here in this Battlefield 4 test, where the Skylake CPU has the edge in terms of both minimum and average frame rates. Looking towards the Witcher 3, you'll see that the performance level between the two is really margin of error stuff, nothing to tell them apart. However, elsewhere there are titles that really enjoy having mammoth CPU frequencies thrown at them. So here's Far Cry 4, lower minimum and average frame rates there on the more modern chip. Now, so far, we've sort of artificially massaged these tests to manufacture CPU-bound scenarios by pairing old CPU technology with the absolute state-of-the-art in graphics hardware, the Titan X. The next step is to get real. Pairing the 2500K with Nvidia's GTX 970 is a real-life test more indicative of how the chip will actually be used in general gameplay. Now, we've overclocked that GTX 970 because, to be frank, you'd be mad not to, particularly if you're overclocking the rest of your system. And the results, well, the results are quite fascinating. First up, let's go nuclear with Crisis 3. At its very high preset, a GTX 970 can indeed spend the vast majority of its time above 60 FPS, but you need the CPU power to match. Our 2500K at stock speeds with slow RAM just doesn't cut the mustard. And as you can see here, 
the effects of overclocking and faster memory only go so far. The modern i5 at 4.5 GHz with 3200 MHz DDR4 only offers around 14% of extra performance overall. But, and this is the crucial thing, the lowest recorded frame rate rises by 30%. Both of these stats demonstrate that even an i5-2500K pushed to its limits can be CPU bound when paired with a GTX 970. But here's an interesting little bonus test we've got to expand on with some more testing. An overclocked Core i7-3770K paired with 2400 MHz DDR3 loses out a touch on minimum reported frame rates compared to the modern Skylake, but its overall performance profile is roughly a match. Now, the cool thing here is that the 3770K will slot right into your existing PC, and you can match that with the faster memory, and this presents a viable upgrade route that is quite compelling. More on that soon. Next up, the Witcher 3. Effectively, this is a rerun of our Titan X test sequence, with the overclocked GTX 970 in play instead. This section of the game is indeed a hard workout for the CPU, maxing out all four cores. Overall frame rates may not be immensely higher with the overclocked 2500K, but you will note that most of the frame time spikes seen are eliminated with faster RAM and higher clock speeds in place. That means less stutter and a more consistent gameplay experience overall. You will note that it's only the modern i5 setup here that can stay consistently north of 60 fps. The village area in Rise of the Tomb Raider, here running at Xbox One settings with some minor enhancements, well that's another great CPU workout. Well, to be honest, this stage is actually enormously taxing on CPU resources and maintaining 60 fps is really hard on less capable hardware. Here we see three distinct tiers of performance, but the 2500k overclock can still hack it with only minor fluctuations under 60 fps. At stock speeds, we really had issues. Project Cars on a circuit with maximum vehicles engaged is also a substantial CPU workout. The 2500K at stock speeds fluctuates above and below 60 FPS here at high settings, but the overclock gives us the additional overhead we need, while the modern i5 simply blows both of them away. So, what about AMD? We've often noted that the AMD graphics driver has additional CPU overhead that can impact frame rates on DX11 titles. So what's the score with an older i5? Well, it is an issue and the importance of that changes on a game by game basis. So let's roll out our factory overclocked ASUS DirectCU3 R9 390. We can't overclock it to anything like the same degree as the 970, so we should expect an Nvidia advantage at 1080p. However, we can identify the additional impact on CPU time caused by the Radeon software layer. So here's a rerun of the Rise of the Tomb Raider Village section with both GTX 970 and R9 390. Now pay close attention to the frame timeline. As we progress into the stage, CPU load increases dramatically, resulting in some pretty horrible stutter on the AMD card. Now, as we've seen in overclocked i7 tests, the R9 390 actually has much more to offer in this game. We're simply being held back by the CPU here. It's an interesting scenario, actually. The press try to recommend hardware for new big gaming releases, but the bottom line is that the more capable GPU may not be the best option for your particular system depending on the CPU you have to power it. Now, we should say that many titles are seemingly unaffected. Check out The Witcher 3 here again. The relative performance level isn't so important here. What's crucial is that frame times are consistent, meaning that the GPU is our limiting factor here. Even Project Cars, a title that long bedeviled AMD hardware, well, that's in pretty good shape actually. And again, the frame times suggest that CPU overhead isn't really an issue here. Okay, so let's wrap this up. Has the 2500K really had its day? Well, in most games, it will still do the job very nicely. Performance on par with the modern i5-6500 isn't really bad at all, even if we really need to push it. But it does go to show that Skylake's multiple architectural improvements, plus access to higher levels of memory bandwidth, do count for something. However, the 2500K may well be a relic in technological terms, but for most modern games, the chances are that it'll stick to that all important 60 FPS threshold. But we've learned a few important things in our testing. First of all, CPU performance scales in line with memory bandwidth. To get the most out of your overclock, I'd strongly recommend 2133 MHz DDR3. It's dirt cheap these days, and believe me, it can make a real difference in gaming. Secondly, in CPU bound scenarios, AMD's suboptimal DX11 driver can eat into your performance in certain games. Now, 
Early tests on the DX12 driver, on the other hand, they look extremely promising. AMD may well be in a better place there even than Nvidia. But DX11 is still the standard for now, and AMD CPU overhead here remains a concern. So, there we go. Hopefully this addresses the topic comprehensively. The only dangling thread concerns a potential 3770K i7 upgrade, and that's something we'll cover soon. But in the meantime, that's all we have for now. Remember that you can support what we do here at Digital Foundry by liking, subscribing, and sharing our work with your friends. But for now, thanks for watching.